Pastor Jay here, and we're going to do our church service from my living room today, probably to your living room too, because of the very strange global circumstances that are going on. And we're going to jump right into Acts chapter 15 and finish out the chapter today. <laughs> yeah, I think we really will. But let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you that in this day and age, we can actually get in your word and experience a time where we're somewhat gathered together, connected by airwaves. I don't understand that, Lord. But it's so good just to be able to get into your word and to look unto you and to have you teach us even from far, far away. Thank you, Lord. We ask for a great protection on the whole world for that matter. And we also say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because we'd love to be with you. Thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, open your Bibles. Got your Bible? Get your Bible out. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Now, while you're doing that, let's catch us up on the situation. You know that we have to do this so that we know that everything that we have here is in a context. Paul and Barnabas have just returned from what we call the first missionary journey of the apostles. They were going around mostly Asia Minor. They had been through Cyprus at one point because, well, Barnabas had relatives there. Remember, he sold off a piece of property uh, over in Acts chapter 5, actually the end of Acts chapter 4, and gave the money to the church. So we know that he was from Cyprus. Barnabas, the uh, son of encouragement, Barnabas, that's what his name means, and Saul, uh, of course, you know, the, again, his, his uh, Greek name that he, or excuse me, his Hebrew name, and he moved, changed it to his Greek name, Paul, which means little. And eventually on the trip, that's what he became known as. And they go off and they begin preaching the gospel among the pagan cities throughout Cyprus and Asia Minor. They go into the synagogues first because they know that there are uh, Gentile God-fearers there. There are Greeks that uh, um, uh, have actually begun to worship God and reverence God, but they wouldn't become Jews first. They wouldn't get circumcised and keep kosher and uh, necessarily even keep the festivals. But they did come to a knowledge of God, of Yahweh, the Lord God, and, and they began to follow him. And so... Paul goes into the synagogues where he runs into the Jews who need to know that Jesus is the Messiah and the God-fearing Gentiles who don't really even understand perhaps the concept of a Messiah or may just a little bit from the Jewish people, but they do worship God. And now here comes Paul and Barnabas into these synagogues of all these various cities and they begin preaching that Jesus is the only way to salvation, that through his death on the cross and his resurrection. You put your faith in him and by grace you are saved. And that's something that the Jewish people had never heard, the Gentile people had no idea about. And as they go through the cities, pretty much the same pattern happens. They establish themselves for days, weeks, sometimes longer, and then they get opposed, they get thrown out of the city. In one city, Lystra, Paul gets stoned, perhaps even to death and maybe raised from the dead. But it, whatever it was, it was extremely serious. And as we pointed out on several occasions, oh man, the chutzpah that comes with people who are passionate about sharing Jesus, where Paul gets right up and goes right back into Lystra after being dragged out from underneath a pile of rocks and being stoned to death. Well, after that, he goes to Derby, and then he, they repeat their, their trip back towards uh, to Lystra, to Iconium, to Pisidian Antioch, back down to the coast, and then they make their way back to Antioch. While they're there, a debate breaks out where should the Gentiles become Jews before they become Christians? Should that be the case? And of course, that's a really, really good question to the people of that time, and especially to the Jews. And a faction of Jews come up from Jerusalem who are not authorized by the leaders of the church, the apostles, and they begin to tell people, yes, if you're going to become a Christian and you're a Gentile, you got to become a Jew first. You've got to get circumcised. I mean, I hate talking about that subject over and over again, but it was so important to them, and it meant salvation to the very Orthodox Jews of that age. So Barnabas it tells us later on, sided with these Judaistic Jews who wanted to turn the Gentiles into Jews before they could become Christians. And so did Peter. Over in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about his confrontation with Peter because Antioch was in the eastern region of Galatia or the area where the Gauls had invaded Asia Minor 200 years before. 
I mean, we, we talked about this before. Remember that if you ever met a Galatian, chances are they would have red hair and turquoise eyes because they came down from the Gaulish areas of Europe and, of course, perhaps even Britain. So it's amazing the, the mix-up of the world at that time as far as people goes. Anyway, Peter sides with the Judaizers, and so did Barnabas. But Paul got in Peter's face and rebuked him, and Peter had a, a very uncharacteristic reaction to Paul's confrontation. He agreed with him, and in fact, basically led the parade for Paul when Paul came back to Jerusalem to talk about this to the apostles, to make sure that the apostles and he were all on the same page, that we are saved by grace, through faith, not by any works of any man's hands, not by circumcision or anything else, or by becoming a Jew, but the Gentiles were able to come into the kingdom of heaven and follow Christ and be received by him at the end of their lives by putting their faith in him and him alone and not in any works that any man could do, including the works of things like circumcision and what have you. And so there is a great council in Jerusalem. Barnabas, remember, was on Peter's side originally. Peter repented and actually spoke for Paul at that council, came to bat for him and said, Paul is right. Barnabas apparently agreed too, but that's not gone into any detail whatsoever. And you'll see in a minute where I'm going with this. Well, the council decides, led by James, that they're going to write a letter to all the churches and that it's going to welcome the Gentiles in. Uh, we're going to put no other burden upon you except for four things. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't eat meat with the blood still in it. Don't drink blood. Don't commit sexual immorality. They, I mixed up the order there, but that's what they said to do. And they did this not to make them more kosher or less offensive to Jews. Those were things that pagans did and were identified as pagans by doing such things. So... They said, stop doing that. You're not pagans anymore. You're not going to participate in pagan worship. So the letter is drafted and off it goes now throughout the churches, starting up at Antioch and then spreading out from there into the Gentile realm, which would be Asia Minor, which was primarily Greek with, so, with a lot of Romans in it and Roman influence because Rome owned it. And then eventually, as we're going to find out in the next chapter, it's going to go over to Europe. By then, this uh, document may be even circulating down into Egypt and places, but it's being brought by people who are witnesses that this is true, that the apostles actually said this, and that this is actually what Jesus did. And so we pick it up in chapter 15, in verse 30, where it says, the men that were sent off and went down to, uh, excuse me, the men were sent off, there we go, and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. It was such an encouragement just to know, you know, the Gentiles don't have to go through all that stuff. They just have to receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Don't forget that Lord part. He rules our lives. We don't just have fire insurance. We have a Lord and Master over us. And Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. Oh, such a ministry of the church is to go around not only by prophets rebuking people, which they're primarily known for when you think of a prophet holding a sign that says repent, or getting in a king's face and saying some very, very, very hard things, but great things from God. But it's also to encourage and to strengthen the brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 33, after spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of God. So they remained there for a long time. They stayed in Antioch, they preached, they taught, they ministered to all the people there, and it was a while. We don't know how long. Some people think it could have been as long as about five years between the first and second missionary journeys. But as they're preparing to go out on the next missionary journey, the second one, Paul and Barnabas run into a snag. And that's what we want to talk about today. In verse 36, some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So they want to go to Cyprus and the cities there, 
and to the south part of Asia Minor and up into Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Let's go encourage them, talk with them. Who knows what's going to come about along the way? See how they're doing. They haven't seen them in a while. Remember, they don't have texting, phones, telegrams like they used to have 100 years ago or whatever to communicate rapidly between each other. You have to send people out. You've got to make disciples, set elders over them quickly and pull out and go to the next destination. What's going to happen to a church like that, especially under pagan Greek influence where these people came out of? It's a good thing to check up on them. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John. Now, this is not John the Apostle, or obviously not John the Baptist, but he wanted to take John, also called Mark. Yes, the Mark. The Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. This is Mark, known as John Mark. Remember, we talked about these people having two different names, a Greek name and a Hebrew name, uh, if they were Jews living in that ancient world. And so John is obviously his Hebrew name, but he's also called Mark. And with the, he wanted to take him with him, Barnabas. Let's take John Mark. But Paul, verse 38, did not think it wise to take him. Now we find out why Mark left them in Cyprus after actually they had left Cyprus and got to the mainland. Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia, right on the coast there of Asia Minor or modern day Turkey, and had not continued with them in the work. He split. He got out. He was intimidated and daunted by all the opposition, the th very, very harsh things that could go on. And verse 39, they, Paul and Barnabas, had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas, also known as Silvanus, by the way, and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Chapter 16, verse 1, it says he came to Derby and then to Lystra. So we know he's backtracking on his original uh, missionary journey. And we're not going to cover that part today, but it just shows you he has now actually gone out and they are now going back to the churches and they're going to break some new territory, which is extremely important and very exciting. And once again, almost like every chapter in the book of Acts, it seems we can say, and this chapter the world changed again. And it does also in chapter 16. But let's look at this terrible disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, because this is kind of a confusing thing. Uh, we wonder, are these allowed in the church? Did God sanction this? What's the deal? Well, first of all, the words here where it says that, you know, of course, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement. Sharp disagreement. Okay, now we would consider that an argument. They disagreed. The word that's used here for sharp disagreement actually has a different connotation. It's a very colorful word. It's only used a couple more times in the New Testament, and it has to do with the fury of God. It's that severe of a word. It literally means not just being angry. It means furious anger. Their disagreement was, well, let's put it like this. It was Middle Eastern. Now, if you have ever seen a real honest-to-goodness Middle Eastern argument, we're not talking about the Hollywood kind. We're talking about being in the Middle East an argument that breaks out between two people and begins to get harsh and sharp does so very, very rapidly. Not because somebody has to win the argument. That's true. They want to, and they're determined to do it if they get into an argument. But in the Middle East, and if you're from there, you'll know what I'm saying, that the argument can be so, so fierce because honor and shame is often at stake in such an argument that if you lose the argument, you are shamed. Now, we saw Peter earlier who is Jewish. He's from Galilee. Galileans have a terrible attitude. And if they get into an argument or they're shamed, I mean, they can really go off. And Peter, you've seen him as an example of that in a few occasions in the Gospels, as well as some other guys like James and John, not John Mark, but John the Apostle, who were known as the sons of thunder because they could fight so, so viciously. And 
They, you know, again, they're Middle Easterners. They do this. But when Peter repents after Paul confronts him, this is not typical of an ancient Jew. For him to become compliant, not only compliant, but an ally and an advocate of Paul on the subject where Peter lost the argument and was confronted by Paul and lost it, that this is absolutely a godly thing. This has so little to do with the way people were in the Middle East and so contrary to it. God changes us in these things. He changes our attitude in these things. We live in a fighting country right now. It's a cold war in our own borders here in the United States. The Republicans against the Democrats against whoever else. The conservatives against the progressives or liberals or whatever you want to call them. It's a, it's a, it's the, 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 the dialogue is not dialogue. It's vicious rhetoric. It's polemics coming at people like a club. It's terrible. The Middle East buries that as far as how really strong the arguments can go. Now, I've witnessed a few of these arguments in the Middle East. I lived in Jerusalem for a few months. Uh, got a chance to see people in the old city, especially among the Arabs. Remember, most of the Jews in the Middle East, especially in Israel, are actually European or African, North African transplants. There are a lot of other people there too. Jews were all over the world and they're coming back to Israel as prophesied in the Bible. But the people that have lived there for so long, the Arabs were indigenous to the area for a really, really long time, thousands of years. They've been in that area, along with the Jews, along with others who conquered them and came in and out, but they were always there. And they really know how to fight. And when you watch them argue with each other, it gets very disconcerting. One of the first things you know that you have a really bad problem on your hand is, so I don't understand any Arabic, but Arabic is a very bold language. It's got a lot, of, a lot of very loud terminology in it so that even a normal conversation might sound like two people are arguing with each other because of the nature of the language, at least to our American ears or English ears. It, that's the way it sounds to us. To them, it's very normal. But when they start amping up because they're getting into an argument, the shouting becomes deafening. And the next thing that you notice is that shoes start coming off of people's feet or sandals or something because... The worst insult you can ever give to a person is to show them the bottom of your shoe or the bottom of your sandal or throw your shoes at them or something like that. That's like saying, I wish you were dead, and if I could, I'd kill you myself. It's a really, really severe, horrible, deadly insult. But when the argument starts to amp up and it starts to get very, very serious, shoes start coming off. And I've seen this happen. I was at a friend's shop in Jerusalem. There's a fellow there whose name is Zach, who has a great shop in the Christian quarter, and he sells antiquities. And I really like spending time with him because he's a Christian brother, and he's an Arab who lives in Bethlehem, so he's quite a guy. And one day, as we're talking, I hear some shouting happening outside. Well, you hear shouting once in a while in the old city of Jerusalem, and because of it's all stone and steel, that it echoes a lot. But Zach got up from his table, and walked over towards the entrance to his shop and sticks his head out the door and looks and we're talking and he's talking to me and I'm talking and as he's we're talking his eyes are huge and he's looking out there talking still carrying on the conversation but his eyes are enormous and then he pulls me back in the shop and he said Jay if this gets any worse we need to get out of here and I'm going to lock the doors of my shop and you need to go out of the doors and to the right and don't come back. <laughs> that was terrifying. Zach, if you're watching this, you probably remember the incident because a few shops down, some of the shopkeepers, two shopkeepers, got into an argument with each other and it somehow involved their families. And when families are involved, you stand up for the family honor and you don't let your family get shamed. And that's where things can escalate into an extremely dangerous mode. Now, Paul and Barnabas are not in that mode but you can imagine the volume, the shouting, the carrying on that would happen between these two men being native Middle Easterners and getting into a sharp dispute that was so, so furious that it caused two men who they knew they were godly examples, they knew they were pillars of the church at that time, that it caused them to divide and go separate ways and do so apparently in anger. Now, they did reconcile. 
and we'll talk about that at the very end. And it's only implied, but it is there. But they parted ways. This is an incredibly sharp disagreement. Now, they get angry about John Mark. Barnabas wants to take him on the journey with them. They did this before. John Mark deserted them. Paul says, we're not going to go through that again. So that's off the table. Barnabas said, no, we need to do this. Paul said, no, we don't. And then it escalates from there. This is the nature of the argument. Now, what's the problem with Mark? Well, obviously he deserted them. Um, he deserted them in the face of the type of op opposition that they might get, uh, demonic warfare, uh, these sorts of things where they have to really fight each other. Uh, you know, fight, so where they have to actually um, uh, f not fight each other, but actually have to flee because the fight is coming to them. Uh, th that might be the opposition might be surprisingly be coming from the Jewish leadership at various synagogues. This is one of those things where uh, Mark would probably be shocked by this. Aren't they supposed to be on our side? Aren't we all, you know, Jews? Aren't we one big happy family? Uh, and then we're bringing the message of the Messiah and suddenly the Jews want to take you on. The pagans don't like you. The opposition becomes demonic because you suddenly run into pagan demonic things going on, magicians and what have you, that want to oppose you. And you're stuck on an island, Cyprus, it's a big island, sure. But then they go to the mainland and now they're on the mainland where the pagans are rich and thick as fleas. And you have lots and lots of Jews there in Asia Minor, the mainland where there at least 10% of the population is Jewish in the mainland at that time, and Mark probably sees the problem, these guys might come after us too. They just came after us on a little secluded island, and now we're on the mainland? Are you kidding me? I think I'm out of here. Too much. And he leaves. The world was a dangerous place in those days. And preaching Jesus was a dangerous thing to do. Not just because you're preaching Jesus. That would make it dangerous in and of itself. Being associated with him was very, very dangerous among a lot of people, even though this is years after Pentecost. At least, at the very least, probably 15 to 20 years after Pentecost. But you remember, may remember the apostles holed up on the night of Jesus' resurrection. They had not seen the risen Jesus except for Peter. And we don't know what happened there. There's no details at all. But the other disciples had not seen the risen Jesus, and he appears in a locked room where they're holed up in Jerusalem, the survivors anyway. Judas was dead and everybody else had fled. Now they get back together again, and Jesus appears in their midst, and they're terrified. Why are they holed up there in the first place? Because the rumor had started that afternoon, starting um, with the Pharisees uh, telling and paying guards or Sadducees, excuse me, paying guards off to tell the story that the disciples had come and stolen the body from the tomb. Now, the guards, it's a death sentence. But for the disciples to be accused of stealing Jesus' body from the tomb, that meant that they had to break into the tomb to do it. And that means they had to break the Roman seals that had sealed the tomb. And when you do that, you're crucified. They will consider you an insurrectionist, against Rome, and they will crucify you. So these guys are really scared. They crucified Jesus. Now we're accused of stealing his body, and they're coming after us next. It was deadly at times to be associated with the risen Jesus, much less with the living Jesus before his crucifixion and his resurrection while he walked the earth, but much more dangerous afterwards. And even for the years after, as you can tell by what we've gone through in the book of Acts, how dangerous it was, but not just dangerous there. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, where the Apostle Paul gives a catalog in 2 Corinthians of the different things that he had to endure just to bring the gospel to different people. He Rivers and, and shipwrecks and floggings and beatings and stonings and being hungry, starving, uh, uh, being so destitute on the road. He, he used the term naked, even though he wouldn't be unclothed. It just basically means he, they had lost everything, whatever it is that they had on their journey from going to point A to point B. It was, this is 
it's just a, a tough world. Plus the governments and, and uh, the way that they ran things. There was no police force in those days. There were Roman garrisons, but try and find a policeman in the Bible. They didn't exist. They didn't have that sort of uh, uh, civic protection in those days. So Mark caves in. It's too rough. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to leave. And he deserts them. And this wasn't the first time that Mark had deserted in a tight situation. Maybe you remember, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Aha, the lights are coming on. The bells are ringing. And when Judas appears and interrupts about three hours of prayer, Jesus then is kissed by Judas. Peter pulls out his sword and he begins to swing away, injuring the servant of the high priest. And Jesus does one of his Jerusalem miracles, the last one that he really does, and puts the ear back on the man and he's healed. But then all the disciples flee. And there is one disciple there who is not among the 12 apostles. So there were other disciples present. Maybe they stayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus met them there because it appears the Last Supper was only with the 12. But there are other disciples present there at the Garden. And one of them is a young man who when the soldiers laid hold of him, they grabbed his tunic and he slips out of his tunic and he flees in the night, as he put it, naked. There in the Gospel of Mark, his own Gospel. That appears to be Mark. And Mark deserted Jesus and the other disciples that night. And it appears that he did not show up in that room the night of the resurrection. He wasn't there, so he was gone, probably at his mother's house. And then he deserts them again, Paul and Barnabas, while on the road to their first missionary journey towards the beginning of the journey. Paul didn't want anything to do with this anymore. He's seeing character flaws. He's seeing a guy who is not fully dedicated to the Lord, a guy who is not fully faithful to the Lord. So what was Mark's problem? Well, if you want to follow Jesus and do as he commanded, the Great Commission, you had to determine to be faithful. You had to determine in your heart that I'm going to do this and I'm going to persevere in doing it. I'm going to stick to it. Those are the two things we mention frequently that you notice in the Bible that when the Lord rewards his faithful in heaven, he rewards them for faithfulness and for perseverance. Other things too, no doubt. But those are the big ones. And Mark demonstrated neither in these cases and Paul had had enough. These were bad circumstances. Now, what was the problem with Barnabas? Well, Barnabas, first of all, John, Mark, Mark, and Barnabas are related to each other. In one passage, it says they're cousins, which basically means they're a relation to each other. It gets more specific later when he is declared as the nephew of Barnabas. So we know that Mark was Barnabas' nephew. Barnabas is the son of encouragement. He's an encouraging man. He's a nice man. He's a forgiving man. He's a man who's quick to overlook people's faults. And I've heard this criticized. Some of the things that I read when reading up on this passage is that, for instance, some of the, some of the commentators that are out there, especially those that lived in the early part of the 20th century or, or uh, back in the 19th century, who are brilliant men, said that they think that Barnabas was in the flesh and that he was at fault. Who am I to disagree with great minds like that? But Barnabas, his character, when he worked with John Mark, made John Mark a better man, as you'll see in just a few minutes. See, Barnabas was an encourager, and encouragers will look past people's failures knowing that God doesn't dispose of people. He doesn't crumple them up like a paper cup and throw them in the trash the moment they spring a leak. He fixes the leak. This is what God did with you and how many times that he's done it with me. And this is what Barnabas did with John Mark by taking him under his wing. Barnabas is an encourager. He is doing the right thing. And he doesn't see Paul's objection as being good. 
Paul should embrace John Mark too. Let's bring him back. Let's restore him. This is something that Jesus told people to do. How many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven times, Peter asked. Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. I could just see Peter counting down to 490, and after you get to 491, we're finished. But you know, that's not what Jesus meant. You get the idea. He, we keep on forgiving our brother. How many times if he sins against me all day long? How many times do I, I forgive him all day long? Paul knew about forgiveness and he preached forgiveness. And he experienced it because he called himself the greatest sinner in the world, which was not a compliment to himself. It was degradation of himself because he was out to kill Christians before Jesus met him on the road and knocked him to the ground and saved him. But Paul was a guy who wouldn't put up with this sort of thing. Barnabas's deal was that he knew nothing but mercy and grace and forgiveness, and he brought Mark back under his wing and said, let's take him out there again and give him another chance. We'll, whatever, maybe we'll coach him. We'll disciple him further. He needs this sort of experience. And a lot of pastors are like that. A lot of pastors are like that. Listen to me, it's not bad. If they're overlooking sin and covering it up, that's a problem. But if somebody sins and they say, let's restore him, that is a very good thing. Are there caveats to that? Sure there are. Sure there are. And we don't have time to go into all of those today, but you know sometimes you just have to put a person out to pasture and say God's going to have to deal with them. That's a very difficult thing to do. Jesus deals with that in Matthew chapter 18 uh, at the very least, and Paul talks about things like that sometimes. But you know, Barnabas saw in his relative, that's another thing, you don't abandon family. And that was an ethic of those days, that you never abandon your family. If you did, you were considered shameful. So he's bound to Mark as his uncle. And therefore, he is required by family ethics of that day, especially Middle Eastern ethics, to make sure that he treats him right, he treats him as family. And Paul probably saw that in Barnabas and said, no, you can't do that. And Barnabas felt bound to do it, and Paul wouldn't work with it. But Barnabas also, because he took John Mark and went to Cyprus, you find that John Mark, over time, by Paul's own admission, began to improve until Mark became virtually indispensable to Paul at the end of his life. So encouragement is a very good thing. Pastors being encouragers are a very good thing. I was working in a similar fashion with a friend who had fallen. He was a pastor. This is a long, long time ago. And I, was, I didn't consider myself qualified to do such a thing. But you know, this guy had fallen and he was repentant, and by his own words he was. And I wanted to help in his restoration, even though I wasn't at the time very qualified to even do that, the Lord knows. And I was talking to another pastor who came down very hard on this man. And I said, but he needs to be restored. And the pastor stuck his finger in my face and he said, Jay, he said, that's because you're just a nice guy. And I went, wow. Is he right? Is that a flaw in my character? And over time, I began to find that maybe I was being too light on him, but he was repentant. And is being a nice guy a bad thing for a pastor if you're trying to restore somebody else to ministry who has fallen? It's a good question, isn't it? You see, God uses encouragers to encourage people, to bring them along, to bring them back to point them to Jesus and get them in the right direction and give them a push. This is Barnabas, son of encouragement, who sees not only family, which he's obligated to, but he sees ministry, which he is also, by his own heart and commitment to Jesus, obligated to. And he's going to restore John Mark, even though John Mark, to Paul, and probably to a lot of people, was a deserter. What was the problem with Paul? Well, Paul, as you look at his life in here and you profile him as best you can, sticking to the Bible, not to extra-biblical writings, just to the Bible, you find that Paul 
was an encourager of a different sort. He was a preacher of truth, a preacher of righteousness. He was prophetic in the sense that he would tell people they needed to turn from their sins. But it doesn't appear to me, though you are free to disagree, and I certainly won't challenge you on it, that he did not have the gift of encouragement the way that Barnabas did. Barnabas' very name says that he had the gift of encouragement. People recognized him as such. Paul, on the other hand, was very, very blunt, in your face, bold, and he stuck to the truth. So did Barnabas. But Paul was much more bold about it. He was, well, he moved aggressively. He moved passionately. He moved deliberately. And he tended to move quickly. The message of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ who met him on the road to Damascus was everything to him. And nothing was going to interfere, slow down, or betray that again. And so Paul lowers the boom on Mark, and Barnabas is in the way. Mark, to Paul, was obviously now high maintenance. He was not trustworthy. He had, Mark had had his chance, even though Paul knew nothing of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, well, unlikely anyway, prior to his conversion. He might have heard something about it. But here comes Mark, learning of Mark that he was the guy that ran at the Garden of Gethsemane, and fled naked, and now he deserts them again. That's two strikes, but to Paul it was three. And we're out. We're done. We're not going to bring him along. And seeing Paul's style of ministry, it appears he had no time for such people. They're in the way. They've had their chance. They're going to get out of the way, and we're not going to use them again. A lot of pastors are like that. When, in fact, a lot of ministers seem disposable. And I've seen pastors do this too. I've had enough with this person. Somebody else is going to have to deal with them. Is that legitimate? Probably. I've seen other pastors say, no, that person is out. We're never going to deal with them again. And watch this person now drift away and drift away and drift away because nobody was willing to restore them because they were shamed. Shamed by that pastor. Now, this is obviously something for ministers to consider. Because we learn from those who are above us and around us, not just denominationally, but all kinds of different people that we watch, that we admire, that we look upon as our mentors. And we find that what our mentors do, we as their protégés, as their underlings, as their disciples, do the same things too with double the passion. But that doesn't mean we do it right. Because... Our mentors may have done it right, but we take what they do and then we turn it into a mechanism. Now, if you're a pastor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we can become much more harsh. You see this in the Old Testament. You see it um, uh, there with Rehoboam. Rehoboam after Solomon died. Rehoboam is a candidate for king. Suddenly they're going to make him the new king. Jeroboam breaks off with him, takes the ten tribes to the north, and he's king up there. But Rehoboam asks the old counselors, what should we do? And he, they said, lower the taxes and treat the people fairly and all of that. Because Solomon really taxed the people heavily. He's a great king, but in the end he didn't finish well at all. And Rehoboam is being advised, be everything that your father wasn't. Do all the good things that your father missed. And then he listened to his young counselors, and they said, you know what, you need to tell the people that my father flogged you with whips, I'll flog you with scorpions. My little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. In other words, I will be a greater tyrant than him. And disciples to great men can actually do things like that, which is really, really sad. You see, what we need to be like is not our mentors. We need to be like Jesus. The person who we need to follow in ministry are not our mentors. We need to learn from them, the good and the bad. But we need to follow Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit and follow his lead too, especially. This is a big mistake that people make. So if your pastor's that way, if I'm that way, or even the other way, and you say, well, I wish you were otherwise, pray for your pastors, pray for your mentors, pray for your leaders, but they may be right. They, just not be, they may not be right according to what you think is right. But what does Jesus think? What does God think? He tells us here. He spells it out here perfectly. You read your Bibles. You find out what he thinks. Well, which part of the Bible? The whole thing. 
Which Bible? The one you're going to read. Read it and find out what God says. It's Him speaking, you know. This is inspired by Him. It's infallible. It's inerrant. He is speaking here. All of it. It's His truth. Listen to Him. So Paul is not going to tolerate this sort of thing. A lot of pastors are like that. And when ministers are yoked with Barnabas-like co-workers, these type of ministers like Paul, they will probably knock heads over the weaknesses of someone else in ministry. And it's happened time and time again. I've been in ministry for a really, really long time. As an assistant pastor, I love being an assistant pastor because you get to do all the fun stuff and the other guy has to take all the heat. And then I became a senior pastor. And that was something that God had in mind. I was very reluctant, but God did it. And even so, watching other pastors, watching things in my own office and among my own people, you find that there are, are conflicts that will pop up where you kind of scratch your head and go, yeah, but is what's happening here really wrong? You see, people will conflict with each other because we have different views of ministry. And whatever your gifts are, you might have the gift of evangelism, for instance. You just can't help but sharing Christ. And then you can't figure out why other people don't want to do it like you do. Because you have the gift and they don't. Well, they're supposed to do evangelism too. Yes, we are. We all are. The message is for everyone to share. But evangelists do it better and more powerfully and gifted by the Holy Spirit to do it. And non-evangelists still do evangelism, but not in the same quality or passion. And I find that people with gifts like that are intolerant of people that don't have gifts like that. We've got to watch out for that too. And that may be going on here between Paul and Barnabas. It sure looks like it might be. There have been so many people in ministry that I've actually had exposure to that have been friends who have tried to, you know, they've seen people that have let them down. They've seen people that have failed, even moral failures or spiritual failures. And so many people have just tossed them away. They're done with ministry. And yet I've watched my own pastor bring people in who have fallen badly and actually put them on staff to recover them because, because nobody is disposable in God's eyes. If you have sinned, if you walked away from the Lord, if you've committed a moral sin or whatever, repent from your sins. Turn your back on that. It means cry out to God, I am lost. I'll, I, God, take me back, please. And God will do that and turn your back on that sin and don't go back to it again. Such people can be restored. Oh, it's sometimes impossible to get your reputation back for the rest of your life. But if you've done these things, or anything like it, remember, God's not done with you. And God wants to use you. And God can even use that failure to teach others, don't do this. But look what God will do with failures. We're all failures. We all fit that category. What does God do with us? Now, here's the question. What was Barnabas's problem? To Paul, he was too lenient. What was Paul's problem? To Barnabas, he was too strict. What was Mark's problem? Mark had a pattern of desertion, at least on two different occasions. Perhaps more. We don't know of any more. Hope not. With Paul and Barnabas, was there ever a reconciliation? And the answer is yes. When did it happen? Listen carefully. It happened over time. Because maybe you need to reconcile with someone. Oh, that's my cat, by the way. That's Castle walking by there. But maybe you need to reconcile with someone. Maybe you're at odds with someone. Maybe you're at odds with a lot of people. And they're Christians. And they're good Christians. But you've knocked heads over something that's not even moral or doctrinal. It's just something. Okay, well, first of all, not everybody's going to get along. Families fight. But reconciliation isn't what we make it up to be in our imaginations. Reconciliation is something where I can look at that person and say, yeah, but I have nothing against them and they owe me nothing, not even an apology. You see, that's what forgiveness is all about. We've talked about this many, many times. When Jesus spoke of forgiveness and he illustrated it, when Jesus spoke of forgiveness and he used parables or metaphors, it was always in the form of an accounting like keeping a ledger on someone. And when he says, forgive us, we say in the Lord's Prayer, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Literally, it is forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. They owe us? No, they don't. Not anymore. In Christ, I have forgiven them completely. They owe me nothing. Does that mean you got to like them? Not necessarily. 
And God will take care of that too. Paul and Barnabas, when they broke off with each other because of the quality, the intenseness of their disagreement, it appears that they left not as happy friends parted from each other. And that could be the case in family, like Christians. But we're not to be known as the fighting people. We're to be known as the reconciling people because families fight, but what do we do with it? That's why we have communion. You break bread with each other, and when you do that, you're reconciling. It's why we have Jesus, the bread of life, in me, in you. He's in me, he's in you. We've both partaken of the bread of life. We're reconciled with each other, not just with him. And we got to remember that. And with Paul and Barnabas, they eventually reconciled. Sometimes it just takes time. And the Bible tends to abbreviate things. It seems like it took overnight, but it really didn't. It took years. And they were brought to reconciliation. How so? We don't know the specifics. But I can tell you this. They had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit brings people together. The Holy Spirit reconciles people together. This is what he does. He doesn't divide people up. We divide people up. We divide each other up. He brings people together. And as somebody once said, and I thought it was a brilliant statement, that whenever two Christians are at each other's throats, at least one of them is not filled with the Holy Spirit. Perhaps both. But forgiveness is not accounting another's sin against them. Understanding and accepting the strengths and weaknesses of spirit filled brothers and sisters is what we do. Not their sins, not ever sins, but your strengths are not their strengths and your weaknesses are not their weaknesses. And we need to remember that. And we need to remember that we are people who restore people to God. And sometimes, yes, we got to obey Jesus. We must obey him at all times and we have to put some people out to pasture, so to speak. But, you know, a lot of times we're denying the opportunity to reconcile because they did, they said, they were. And suddenly they're not, do I trust him anymore? Well, forgiveness 70 times 7. And each time your brother sins against you. Whew, that's risky. Uh -huh. That it is. But it's up to God to bear the fruit. Am I to be wise and not be taken in again? That's true too. And maybe that was Paul. Maybe that's what he was thinking. But in the end, God changed everything because here's the result. And I'm going to start wrapping things up with this. You know what that means. It means I'm going to talk for another 20 minutes. No. Colossians, Paul writes at the very end of Colossians in his greetings, Colossians 4.10, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. This is in Colossians. As does Mark cousin of Barnabas. And then he put in parentheses this, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. In other words, they've heard things about him. Perhaps they've heard what Paul and Barnabas, the, 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 the loggerheads that they came to as far as this furious disagreement knocking heads with each other. Maybe the word got to the Colossians that Paul hated Mark or, or Barnabas and Paul broke up because of Mark. And Mark says, no matter what you've heard about him, you receive him, you take him. That's Paul going to bat for Mark, despite Mark's real honest-to-goodness failings. No rumors here. They were real. And yet Paul says, as he says, Mark greets you and receive him, no matter what you've heard about him. This is how we love one another too. But wait, Philemon, little tiny book there in the New Testament. It doesn't even, it's just one chapter. So it's just verses. Philemon, verse 23 and 24. Listen to this. Epaphras, you may have heard about him. One of Paul says, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Mark was among Paul's fellow workers. Now Mark is working with Paul. Now Paul is working with Mark. Demas, by the way, who came on like gangbusters, eventually fell away and was never recovered. But Mark, who was denied by Paul, is now one of his fellow workers. Something's changed. And finally, in 2 Timothy, and this is the one you may remember, chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, Paul writes this, do your best, he's talking to Timothy, 
Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Yes, the Luke who wrote the book of Acts. And then he says this, and this is one of the most beautiful statements I find in Scripture because it's so telling, if you know the whole story like we've talked about today. He said, get Mark, get Mark, Timothy, and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Isn't that beautiful? With all the people that have ever failed us, may they end up being helpful to us in our ministry. The failures that I have been over my life, God has, I hope, made me helpful to others and theirs too. Mark went on to write the Gospel of Mark. Likely with Peter's help, but he did it. Whatever happened to Barnabas? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 3 through 6. Let me read it to you. This is Paul speaking from, he's writing to the Corinthians. He said, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? He's talking about the rights of an apostle. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? In other words, that's Peter, Cephas, it's Aramaic, and, and he brought his wife with him when he ministered. Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Paul ended up reconciling with Barnabas and working physically, doing a job with him, because Paul did that in order to prove that when he came into a town, he wasn't coming in like some sort of a traveling philosopher to rip people off. He came into town in order to preach, and he worked to prove that he wasn't there for their money, and Barnabas was working with him. They did reconcile, and the results the ministries of both Paul and Barnabas thrived, and Mark was not disposed of, but grew and became, as far as we can tell in every way, a mighty man in the things of God. He became important and helpful to the Apostle Paul, the one who didn't want him along in the journey, didn't trust him. He became the first gospel writer. Mark was written first. And that's pretty good. Indeed it is. So there you go. That brings us to the end of chapter 15. And now we move on to the second missionary journey of Paul and Silas and a few others that join them. Right away, Timothy pops in. But you got a lot to chew on. If you're in ministry, we have a lot to consider. And everything that I said today is going to be something that, well, we're going to have to lay out before the Lord and sort out our conflicts with other Christians. And what are we going to do with them? And how does God want to deal with it? But I can guarantee you this. The Holy Spirit only brings people together. It's the flesh and Satan who divide. And I don't want to do that. God help us all. Father, thank you for this beautiful passage of Scripture and for this amazing account and not leaving it ending there, but showing us through all these other letters what you eventually did. And though it's mentioned small, it is so big, so great. Help us, Lord, also to be reconcilers with those who offended us, with those who we trust no longer. Or Lord, just help us to be about your business, encouraging and preaching and teaching, but not judging. That's your job. Thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll talk again soon.